لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وبعد We are still uh, explaining the book of Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al-Sa'di رحمه الله تعالى الوسائل المفيدة للحياة السعيدة The beneficial means to a happy life We spoke previously about his life and about the story of the book, why he wrote this book and uh, started explaining the first part of the book where he talks about the means that can really give us a sense of well-being in our lives the uh, tools that are helpful in attaining a life of well-being and balance and the first uh, means that he shares is actually Al-Iman Wal-Amal Al-Salih Al-Iman Billah Wal-Amal Al-Salih so we saw how belief in Allah, proper Iman, that uh, yields righteous actions is actually one of the most powerful means to attaining a state of well-being and a life of happiness and contentment. Second uh, means that he shared was Al-Ihsanu ila al-Khalq Doing acts of kindness towards others. Doing acts of kindness towards others. So when we extend acts of kindness when we care for others, something special happens within us. Our whole chemistry changes. And uh, today in the science of um, in neuroscience, neuropsychology, this thing is very well, is, is well known. And there is something called the uh, kindness experiment. Kindness experiment. It's actually it was uh, done that they experimented on certain people where they wired them to see what was going on and they scanned their brains as well. So they wanted to see what happens in the brain when a person engages in an act of kindness. So, and it, f it was first at the beginning, it was meant, this, uh, this experiment, when it was first done, they wanted to see how acts of kindness <laughs> affect the brain of the recipient, the one who receives the gift, like, or the act of kindness. And uh, they realized that when a person receives an act of, an act of kindness, uh, the chemistry of the brain changes. So there are hormones, what they call the happiness or well-being hormones, uh, like uh, uh, serotonin uh, and dopamine are actually produced in the brain. And these cause a state of well-being and a feeling of grace, a feeling of grace. <laughs> But what was shocking to the experimenters, they found that a similar thing happens to the brain of the one who does the act of kindness, who extends the act of kindness. And uh, so they decided to expand the experiment afterwards, and they, they decided to study a third party, which is someone who ob observes this act of kindness. And they realized even the observer experiences the same thing. So you can see, subhanAllah, al-ihsanu ila al-khalq, being good to others, uh, doing someone a favor, even just being kind. And uh, any kind of, any act of kindness, it could be something physical that you give a gift you give to someone, or it could be something that's non-physical. Could be a smile, could be a sincere word of compliment. Uh, this also has the sim similar impact. So imagine not only the recipient, but even the giver experiences the blessings of this kindness and not only these two but even a third party who's observing this they experience the same thing and by the way this explains why some videos go viral on YouTube specifically when these have to do with you know helping homeless people sometimes you see a lot of these videos actually become very viral is because of the experience that you have so you as the observer of this you get affected sometimes you get even emotional but it's not negative you feel emotional but you feel some a sense of grace within and subhanallah the 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 explanation to this is that acts of kindness they act against our nafs which is our ego our false self because they act against there is the desire of the self is always I want me 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 give me so when you go against this you empower your soul you empower your heart and when you do these acts of kindness, this is something that touches your heart and awakens your soul. So this is why you become more spiritual at that time. And this is why the surge of happiness and well-being and peace and tranquility, it comes from you empowering the soul over the self. 
That's what happens at that moment. So now we, we're going to deal with a third means to happiness or well-being that Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'di shares in his book. As usual, I will read from this book, inshallah, paragraph, uh, one paragraph at a time and then explain it. So he says, Faslun. وَمِنْ أَسْبَابِ دَفْعِ الْقَلَقِ النَّاشِئِ عَنْ تَوَتُّرِ الْأَعْصَابِ وَاشْتِغَالِ الْقَلْبِ بِبَعْضِ الْمُكَدِّرَاتِ الْاشْتِغَالُ بِعَمَلٍ مِّنَ الْأَعْمَالِ أَوْ عِلْمٍ مِّنَ الْعُلُومِ النَّافِعَةِ فَإِنَّهَا تُلْهِ الْقَلْبَ عَنْ اشْتِغَالِهِ بِذَلِكَ الْأَمْرِ الَّذِي أَقْلَقَهُ فَإِنَّهَا تُلْهِ الْقَلْبَ عَنْ اشْتِغَالِهِ بِذَلِكَ الْأَمْرِ الَّذِي أَقْلَقَهُ وَرُبَّمَا نَسِيَ بِسَبَبِ ذَلِكَ الْأَسْبَابَ الَّتِي أَوْجَبَتْ لَهُ الْهَمَّ وَالْغَمَّ فَفَرِحَتْ نَفْسُهُ وَازْدَادَ نَشَاطُهُ وَهَذَا السَّبَبُ أَيْضًا مُشْتَرَكٌ بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِ وَغَيْرِهِ He is saying one of the means that repel stress, anxiety and tension uh, and remove the thoughts that bring about these states of negativity is to engage in a physical act Enga engage in an activity engage in an activity or engaging in studying or learning something so you engage yourself either in something that you do and perform or you engage in a study about a subject it could be a course that you take in school or in a training uh, with a training uh, organization or you take it with an online you know educational uh, platform or you go and study probably at a masjid or with a person and so on and so forth so that you busy yourself or you engage yourself with either something that engages you bodily so you, it engages your body you have to engage with it and on a, at a physical level or you engage with it at an intellectual level so what it does it, it the secret here is that it absorbs your attention it absorbs your attention so he's saying فَإِنَّهَا تُلْهِ الْقَلْبَ عَنِ اشْتِغَالِهِ بِذَلِكَ الْأَمْرِ الَّذِي أَقْلَقَهُ So it distracts the heart from focusing on the source of anxiety. When you get yourself busy in something, it engages your attention. Your attention is completely absorbed. So when your attention is absorbed with what you do, you don't have attention to focus on the source of your pain, your anxiety and your stress. So what happens, you're completely distracted from it and suddenly it disappears from your life. Because it's our mind that creates our stress. Our mind is what creates our stress. Because when we focus on negative things, our mind will stress out and we will experience this. So it's, this is about managing attention. Being able to manage your attention. Where you put your attention, and this is why there's a famous statement, comes from different sources. They say where attention goes, energy flows. Where attention goes, energy flows. Anything you focus on, you give it power over yourself. You focus, for example, you had a negative uh, maybe meeting with someone. Someone was very negative, very aggressive towards you. It was a very unpleasant experience with that person, interaction. You could keep focusing on this all day and you would feel bad about yourself and you would feel negative and by the end of the day you'd be completely exhausted and probably depressed. And you could shift your attention away from it and decide to focus on something else. Focus on something pleasant. You'll be surprised once you shift your attention, how your mood will change. So oftentimes people when they fall, people say, oh, you know, uh, I'm experiencing uh, depression. As if it's happening to them. This is what most people, this is how they express it. You know, by the way, depression doesn't happen to you. It doesn't happen. You do depression. You do anxiety. You do anxiety, you do stress, you do, by putting your attention on the source of stress. By putting your attention on the source of stress. I know a lot of people have questions or have comebacks at this. But inshallah, we will deal with that. So, فَإِنَّهَا تُلْهِ الْقَلْبَ عَنْ اشْتِغَالِهِ بِذَلِكَ الْأَمْرِ الَّذِي أَقْلَقَهُ Because it distracts, focusing on these, engaging these activities or this studying, it distracts the heart from uh, focusing on the source of anxiety. وَرُبَّمَا نَسِيَ بِسَبَبِ ذَلِكَ الْأَسْبَابَ الَّتِي أَوْجَبَتْ لَهُ الْهَمَّ وَالْغَمْ And probably, perhaps, by means of that, he would forget completely the reasons that causes him, he's talking about a person who goes through hardship, he probably, by focusing on what he does, on this activity that he's engaged in, that would lead him to forget about the reasons for his anxiety. 
فَفَرِحَتْ نَفْسُهُ So his self or his mood would improve and would be happy, he would rejoice. وَزْدَادَ نَشَاطُهُ He would fall, feel more energy, more energetic about himself. وَهَادَ السَّبَبُ أَيْضًا مُشْتَرَكٌ بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِ وَغَيْرِهِ And he says this means or this tactic is actually can be done by someone who believes in Allah and can be done by someone who doesn't believe in Allah. This is available to all human beings. وَلَكِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ This is a new paragraph. وَلَكِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ يَمْتَازُ بِإِيمَانِهِ وَإِخْلَاصِهِ وَاحْتِسَابِهِ فِي اشْتِغَالِهِ بِذَلِكَ الْعِلْمِ الَّذِي يَتَعَلَّمُهُ أَوْ يُعَلِّمُهُ وَيَعْمَلُ الْخَيْرَ الَّذِي يَعْمَلُهُ إِنْ كَانَ عِبَادَةً فَهُوَ عِبَادَةً وَإِنْ كَانَ شُغْلًا دُنْيَوِيًّا أو عَادَةً دُنْيَوِيًّا أَصْحَبَهَا النِّيَّةَ الص فَكَمْ مِنْ إِنْسَانٍ ابْتُلِيَ بِالْقَلَقِ وَمُلَازَمَةِ الْأَكْدَارِ فَحَلَّتْ بِهِ الْأَمْرَاضُ الْمُتَنَوِّعَةِ فَصَارَ دَوَاؤُهُ النَّاجِحِ نِسْيَانُ السَّبَبِ الَّذِي كَدَّرَهُ وَأَقْلَقَهُ وَاشْتِغَالُهُ بِعَمَلٍ مِنْ مُهِمَّاتِهِ وَيَنْبَغِي أَنْ يَكُونَ الشُّغْلُ الَّذِي يَشْتَغِلُ فِيهِ مِمَّا تَأْنَسُ بِهِ النَّفْسِ وَتَشْتَاقُهُ فَإِنَّ هَذَا أَدْعَى لِحُصُولِ الْمَقْصُودِ النَّافِعِ وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ He says here there's a difference between a believer he says this means is available to believers and non-believers but there is uh, a merit here there is an exception for the believer in this case he says because the believer has an advantage here because he has iman and he has sincerity for Allah sincerity of intention and seeking reward from Allah so when he does when he engages in an activity or he engages in learning something he does that for the sake of Allah so it's not only he's, he has an activity to engage in but he also has an intention which is for a greater uh, cause. And whatever good that he does, it's either a worship, an act of worship, or it could be some matter of this dunya. It could be sports, it could be a craft, it could be some art, maybe drawing, maybe carving, maybe uh, you know, working on some project, maybe toys, anything. Or maybe so he's saying, and if it's not a religious act, or originally not, so, not an act of worship, uh, but something from this dunya, he can add to that good intention. So he can be doing it uh, with the intention that I'm doing this to help myself worship Allah. So maybe I'm playing sports to strengthen my body so I can worship Allah better. Or maybe I'm doing this so I remove the stress in order for me to be able to focus on worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or maybe I'm doing this, th I'm learning this and I'm bet benefiting myself and the ultimate intention for this is actually to be a better servant of Allah, to be a better Muslim. So there's always the concept of intention is always available to the Muslim or to the believer. So he says this is a very effective uh, tool to remove or repel uh, sadness and uh, sources of anxiety and pain. Then he says how often there is a person that has been tried with uh, anxiety and stress and overwhelming uh, you know, negat negativity, then he says this caused him a lot of physical illnesses. And this is something that's known by doctors. People in the medical profession, they will tell you that mind is everything. Mind is everything. That what your state of mind affects your body. So they say a lot of the illnesses that we have, they're actually manifestations of long-lasting negative states of mind. So when you dwell in sadness and pain and you keep thinking about uh, you know, the, the, the bad things that happen to you, you keep rehearsing that in your mind, this creates a lot of negativity, bitterness, and this ultimately poisons your body. It poisons your body because it, it leads to the uh, production of uh, stress hormones in your body. Stress hormones exhaust your body because they are meant to help you only in emergencies. But if you keep focusing on negativity, what will happen? These will destroy, I mean these hormones will, uh, stress hormones will be, like cortisol, will be produced and will be flushed into your bloodstream for longer and elongated periods of time. And what, what that does, it wears you out. It destroys your kidneys, your hearts, your lungs, your brain, all the systems in your body. So the person will age quickly and anyone who has, who's prone to illnesses like tumor or kidney failure or diabetes or blood pressure, 
this will actually accelerate the process of deterioration. So this is something that's very well known. So they tell you, m connection of mind and body is very strong. So he's saying here that uh, all this kind of sadness and negativity and stress, if a person is tr is, is succumbs to that or they indulge in these uh, in this negativity, it will cause a lot of physical illnesses. So he says, and the only successful or effective uh, treatment to this is actually forgetting the reason that was causing them the stress and the anxiety and to engage themselves in another activity that would distract them from it. And he says, uh, and he gives a very beautiful tip here, he says, that the thing that you engage in, what to choose, you know, what should I engage in? Is it like a physical activity? Is it sports? Is it arts? Is it uh, knowledge, science? any kind of uh, intellectual endeavor and learning process, or maybe something, uh, some profession, or some skill. So he's saying it should be He's saying that you should actually see what you are naturally inclined to. What do you, what do you have a passion for? What do you love doing? So you do what you love, that's what he's saying. That you find a lot of peace, you have a lot of attraction to it, you are drawn to it naturally. So he says this is more likely to give better fruits in that context. So you, you, you want to distract yourself from the causes of, of uh, anxiety and stress? Try to look into yourself, sense out yourself, what do you love doing? What do you engage in? What do you find yourself drawn into? So the things that you are naturally, you have a head for these things, or you are naturally drawn into these things, these are the things that are most likely to work out for you in such a context. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that's the third means that he's sharing. I know some people have uh, concerns, let me take your questions. So does anyone have a question or a comeback? It's good to have a discussion about these. I know some, okay, let me ask the question for some of you probably. Okay, you know, you might say, okay, why should I just ignore my problem and focus on something else when I need to fix it? In order to fix it, I need to think about it, right? I need to think it through, I need to face it. I can't run away from my problems, okay? Isn't this a valid question? Yeah. It's absolutely a valid question, right? Now, he's not suggesting to run away. He's talking about stress and anxiety. So there are two types of thinking. There is clear thinking where you separate yourself from the problem emotionally. And you think about the problem logically. And you see what you can do about it. By this, you actually, you move into a higher level of thinking where you think with clarity. And I know this is difficult, but with you know, uh, a little bit of training, you can actually achieve this. And slowly, slowly you get better at that. So detach from the situation as much as possible and deal with it as a mathematical equation that you need to solve. He's not, he, what he's talking about, stop thinking, he's not saying stop thinking completely, what he's saying st stop worrying about it. So there's a difference between thinking and worrying. Worrying is excessive thinking and it's thinking with a negative tendency or inclination. When you think negatively, by the way, about something, you, your, mind, your mind is not set on the path to find solutions, but you're just dwelling on the problems. That's it. And so we need, it's important as well to understand how our minds work. Um, I don't know who said this, but it could, be, it could be Einstein. He said that ships were not invented by contemplating the sinking of things, but the floating of things. Oftentimes, we're not thinking of solutions, we're thinking of problems. And that's where the stress comes. And you will see oftentimes that if you have a problem and this problem has really like has worn you out and you're completely exhausted and overtaken, if you get a break from it, something comes and distracts you completely from it, then you come back to it, a couple of days later you, have, you look at it and you say, oh, I was completely lost, it's so easy to deal with this problem. But when we overthink about a problem, it sucks us in and we get trapped and we can't think clearly. 
and we can't think clearly. So we need to understand this limitation, that when we think of a problem, we need to think with a sense of detachment, emotional detachment. This comes with training. If you train yourself, keep trying, you always can, can get better at it. And that's the way you can deal it. And by the way, today, they're helping people uh, you know, break from addictions. They're helping people, and they're teaching this as a strategy for people who have suicidal thoughts. You know when someone has suicidal thoughts, you think, oh, they're doing it by choice. It seems to be on the surface, but obviously they got themselves there. But when they are in the moment, something takes over them and they completely lose control. They find themselves drawn into. I looked into some people who really had suicidal thoughts. They said it's just like there is a whirlwind outside. There's a hur hurricane and it's sucking the wind out of the building and an, opening, uh, and an opening happens in the window and I feel sucked into it. And they feel, they says, even one of them says, he describes an incident where he was about to commit suicide. He said, I held on to the door as if wind was trying to, you know, blow me away and I was holding on to the door trying to, you know, hold tight to it. This is how the thoughts overtake, it, overtake the person. And that's as well what we know as waswas, by the way. Sometimes we have this obsessive thinking that did you make wudu or not? You know, some people really like wash the whole body probably 10, 20 times, and they're still not convinced that they made wudu. It's a similar process. It's obsessive thinking. So these people lose control completely to their thoughts, and what happens, they lose control, and the thought process becomes very negative, and it sucks them in. And obviously, shaitan blows into this. Shaitan blows into this. So we need to understand how our minds think. So now, in these days, and they're saying that the, the outcomes of these of this technique in getting people out of addictions, out of suicidal thoughts, is actually more effective than any other treatment that is, that's, been, that's known so far. That's the most successful treatments. It's called detached thinking. Like they say, they teach people, they say, okay, you have a thought and it's sucking you in that I want to kill myself. I need to end my life. I can't take this anymore. And they feel they've lost control. They say straight away detach from it and don't fight this thought, let it be but see yourself separate from it. And it does work. At the beginning it's a bit hard because we're not used to detached thinking, but once the people get basic training on it, they become very good at it. And they detach themselves. And they, they say afterwards, these are people talking about their experiences with this specific approach. Uh, they basically say afterwards after we learned this, I see suicidal thoughts coming in and I can feel the pull. Then I say to myself, I'm separate, that's something else. It's a thought, it's okay, it has the right to be, go through my mind, I'm just gonna observe it, but I don't have to respond to it, I have the choice. <coughs> and it does work for them. So what he's saying here, okay, not don't think about your problems, not think about them, and focus on solutions, try to find out solutions. But once you start worrying, that's not thinking, it's not logical, it's actually, we can, and this is something about our brains as well, that most of, most of humans see their problems worse than they really are. We're not objective thinkers. We're not. We're not objective thinkers. We are a mixture of emotions and thinking. We're a mixture. So our thought process, and this is an issue with our perception. There's a difference between reality and our perception of reality. Our perception, perception, perception of reality is extremely biased extremely biased and we have to realize this but most of us don't realize that reality is something our perception of it is something else once you are able to tell the difference and see the distance between these two you're better you will develop a sense of humbleness you will develop a sense of openness and you will develop a sense of ease so you know okay now my mind is going wrong I know it I feel everyone is against me. No, not everyone is against you. But when you get into this you know, pitfall, you, you go downhill in that emotional state, it's going to color everything you see and everything you interpret. So you need to recognize it. Fine, I'm not in a good state. My mind is not seeing everything as clear as it is. Okay, I'm not seeing reality. I'm seeing a biased, distorted reality. I shouldn't make decisions now. This time shall pass. So that's an elaboration on what he said here. So uh, I believe Dale Carnegie in his original book, as far as I remember, and when he talks about this, he mentions uh, the story of someone who took part 
in World War II. And this man uh, was sent with the American army. Uh, and I think the job that was given to him was basically, he was sent to Europe. His job was every time they received a body of an American soldier, he was meant to contact their family, write them a letter or a telegraph, send them something and pack all their personal belongings and make sure that they're sent back to their families. So he had to search those dead people and he had to deal with their personal memories, sometimes diaries, sometimes pictures, sometimes personal stuff, jewelry, etc. And that destroyed him emotionally. So when he was sent back after the war and uh, uh, he retired, he was still young, he said, I could not sleep for months, just could not sleep. Anxiety, stress, pain, trauma, lost hope and everything. He said, I lost my family, I lost everyone turned away from me. And uh, he said, basically, I think he ended up weighing only 90 pounds. He said, I was just bones, skin on bones. I ended up being skin on bones. And he said, when I, I used to lay in my bed waiting for death any time to come and take me. And he said, I was wishing for death to come because what I was going through for me was you know, far more painful than death. But he said, one day something just went through my mind and said, why do I just succumb to that level? Why do I just do this? So he remembered in, uh, in the garage in his house, he used to do, he used to, uh, do some, he used to actually, one of his previous hobbies was to create boats out of wood. He would big pieces of wood, he would make boats. So he used to carve them in wood. So he decided, he said, I haven't done this for years. So he decided to go bring his tools, uh, get them out of the closet, and he started, something just pushed him into started starting working with a piece of wood. And he said, it was early in the morning, I only woke up like I came back to my senses when it was uh, the end of the day. And as I looked around, I wasn't stressed. And he said, I've never experienced this level of uh, comfort and uh, peace and lack of anxiety for years in my life. He said, I, I've, I haven't, I've even forgot how this feels. But he said, I realized that my engagement with that work, with doing something that I liked, which is a physical skill, engaged in it, made me forget all my pain. He said, I did not remember anything of my pains. So he said, so I kept doing this and after a couple of weeks, I started to put on weight. My physical, my physique started to get back to, it, to its normal shape. My mental health was getting better. And he said, a few months later, I, w I was back into normal life. And he said, I learned that, I learned that lesson. So that's the story uh, Dale Carnegie uh, mentions, as far as I remember, that's been years, years ago. But I think that's what he is talking about. Okay, any concerns about this before I move on? Okay, let's move to the next means of, to a tranquil life or a life of well-being. وَمِمَّا يَدْفَعُ بِهِ الْهَمَّ وَالْقَلَقْ أَوْ يُدْفَعُ بِهِ الْهَمَّ وَالْقَلَقْ اجتماعُ الْفِكْرِ كُلِّهِ عَلَى الْاِهْتِمَامِ بِعَمَلِ الْيَوْمِ الْحَاضِرِ وقطعه عن عن الاهتمام في الوقت المستقبل أو المستقبل وعن الحزن على الوقت الماضي ولهذا استعاذ النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من الهم والحزن. That's beautiful. He says another means to a life of happiness and well-being. That's number four. اجتماع الفكر كله على الاهتمام بعمل اليوم الحاضر. He says. Gathering your attention, unifying your attention on your present day, on what you're doing your present day. So you don't worry about the future and you, and you don't ruminate about the past. So you focus on your day. It's only the present, only this day that you have. Focus and some people call this presence. You have a presence in what you do and what you engage in today. So you're not living in the future, you're not living in the past. You live at the present moment, the present time. And when you do this, 
you'll be surprised that there's no reason to have any anxiety because anxiety comes from fearing or worrying about what will happen or what will not happen or feeling sad and stressed out about what happened in the past but in the present, something about the present even when it's hardship and calamity if you are present in it, if you are dealing with it you don't feel that you don't feel that and even if you feel pain or you feel stress at the present moment it's usually you're worrying about something in the future how this will end up so, so he's saying, uh, so block or cut your attention from extending into the future or going back and having uh, sadness or anxiety about the past. And he says, this is why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. So he's saying, al-hazan ala al-umur al-madiyya allati la yumkin radduha wa istidrakuha. He says, hazan is sadness and anxiety and remorse about things in the past that you could not change anymore. Things happen, they're done. They're finished work. You can't undo the past. It's done. So he's saying this is al-hazan. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hazan. Allah uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, oh Allah, I seek your protection from falling into hazan, which is ruminating about the past, remorse about the past, trying to change what's already done, undoing it, which you can't. والهم الذي يحدث بسبب الخوف من المستقبل الهم is actually worry about what could happen in the future or not happen in the future he says فيكون العبد ابن يومه so he says the person becomes the son of his own day you become the man of your own day deal with your own day deal with the present day the present moment يجمع جده وَاجْتِهَادَهُ فِي إِصْلَاحِ يَوْمِهِ وَوَقْتِهِ الحاضر. So he gathers all his effort and all his attention and all his focus in fixing the present day. In fixing and dealing with the present day and the present moment. وَقْتِهِ الحاضر. فَإِنَّ جَمْعَ الْقَلْبِ عَلَى ذَلِكِ يُوجِبُ تَكْمِيلَ الْأَعْمَالِ وَيَتَسَلَّى بِهِ الْعَبْدُ عَنِ الْهَمِّ وَالْحَزَنِ He is saying, doing this, focusing your attention, on the present moment and the present day and the, the uh, activity you're engaged, you're presently engaged in, he says it brings you perfection of what you do. So you do what you do well and it also protects you from worrying about the future and ruminating about the past. So it's a double, it's, it's actually has double benefit. وَالنَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا دَعَى بِدُعَاءٍ أَوْ أَرْشَدَ أُمَّتَهُ إِلَىٰ دُعَاءٍ فَهُوَ يَحُثُّ مَعَ الْإِسْتِعَانَةِ بِاللَّهِ وَالطَّمَعِ فِي فَضْلِهِ عَلَى وَالطَّمَعِ فِي فَضْلِهِ عَلَى الْجِدِّ وَالْإِجْتِهَادِ فِي التَّحَقُّقِ لِحُصُولِ مَا يَدْعُو لِحُصُولِهِ وَالتَّخَلِّي عَمَّا كَانَ يَدْعُو لِدَفْعِهِ لِأَنَّ الدُّعَاءَ مُقَارِنٌ لِلْعَمَلِ فَالْعَبْدُ يَجْتَهِدُ فِيمَا يَنْفَعُهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَالدُّنْيَا وَيَسْأَلُ رَبَّهُ نَجَاحَ مَقْصِدِهِ وَيَسْتَعِينُ بِهِ عَلَى ذَلِكَ He's explaining a very important point here about dua because often times we think okay dua is something you say with your tongue and that's it he's going to clarify something about this and for those who are who were here today for the friday khutbah i mentioned as-sabirin the patient ones allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them alladhina idha asabatuhum musibah qalu inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un they are the ones when they are hit by hardship or calamity they say inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un to allah we belong and unto him we will return and I clarified in the khutbah, this is not the state of their tongues only. Yes, they say that with their tongue, but this reflects their state of being, their state of heart, what they believe in. That's what the whole state is saying. So this is a bit similar. So he's saying the Prophet ﷺ, when he makes a dua, or he advises us and teaches us a dua, to make a dua, he is also, like he, along with showing us how to seek Allah's help, and hope for his, uh, for his uh, grace and his blessing. He's also adding to this that we do our part of the job. So you ask Allah for money, that you actually couple this with working or with starting a project. So you have to follow the means. So dua is not only what you say with your tongue, is you say with your tongue and you also do or you fulfill the means that are necessary for the attainment of your goal. So, 
على الجد والاجتهاد في التحقق لحصول ما يدعو لحصوله. So he's saying that you also engage, the Prophet is teaching us along with dua, engaging in whatever is necessary to help us achieve the result or the result of this dua. And to give up whatever keeps us away from it. Okay, so laziness is going to hold you back from achieving your goal. So you, you can't make dua, you know, and just sit back. So you have to give up also laziness. Along with dua, you do the work. He says, dua and amal, action, doing, are supposed to be together. فَالْعَبْدُ يَشْتَهِدُ فِي مَا يَنْفَعُهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَالدُّنْيَا So the, uh, the person uh, does everything they can or he can uh, with to, uh, to achieve what benefits him in this dunya and in matters of the deen. وَيَسْأَلُ رَبَّهُ نَجَاحَ مَقْصَدِهِ He asks Allah to help him attain success and achieve his goal and he seeks Allah's help with this. So he says كَمَا قَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ اِحْرِصْ عَلَى مَا يَنْفَعُكْ وَاسْتَعِمْ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا تَعْجَزْ You know, اِحْرِصْ be keen, be very keen on the things that are beneficial to you. Be keen. And that's advice from the Prophet ﷺ. Be keen on what is beneficial to you. وَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ And seek Allah's help. وَلَا تَعْجَزْ وَلَا تَعْجَزْ لَا تَعْجَزْ means don't fall back into laziness. Don't hold back any effort or anything you can actually do. وَإِذَا أَصَابَكَ شَيْءٌ فَلَا تَقُلْ And if something happens to you, meaning negative, فَلَا تَقُلْ Don't say لَوْ أَنِّي فَعَلْتُ كَذَا كَانَ كَذَا وَكَذَا Don't say only if, you know, Oh, had I done this, it would have been different. Don't, he said, don't do this. فَإِنَّ لَوْ تَفْتَحُ عَمَلَ الشَّيْطَ وَلَكِنْ قُلْ قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ But say, Allah has decreed, Allah made a decision, and whatever Allah decrees comes, into, comes to pass. Whatever Allah uh, wills will take place. فَإِنَّ لَوْ تَفْتَحُ عَمْلَ الشَّيْطَانِ Because using statements like what if or had I done this or that, this opens the scope or the arena for shaitan to, you know, to mess around with you. فَجَمَعَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بَيْنَ الْأَمْرِ بِالْحِرْصِ عَلَى الْأُمُورِ النَّافِعَةِ فِي كُلِّ حَالِ وَالِاسْتِعَانَةِ بِاللَّهِ وَعَدَمِ الْإِنْقِيَادِ لِلْعَجْزِ الَّذِي هُوَ الْكَسَلُ الضَّارِ so he's saying in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ combined together his command or his advice that we are keen and we seek the things that are good for us in all our states and that we seek Allah's help and that we do not succumb to laziness, al-ajiz, which is laziness, he's saying. And he's also combining submission, submission and acceptance of the things that already happened. I can't change them. You know, you say, قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ مَا شَاءَ فَعَلُ This thing happened, I can't undo it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a decree and whatever He willed came into existence. وَمُشَاهَدَةِ قَضَاءِ اللَّهُ وَقَدْرِهِ To see, it's actually the قضاء and قدر of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then He says, وَجَعَلَ الْأُمُورَ قِسْمَيْنِ قِسْمًا يُمْكِنُ الْعَبْدِ السَّعْيَ فِي تَحْصِيلِهِ أو تحصيل ما يمكن منه أو دفعه أو تخفيفه فهذا يبدي فيه العبد مجهوده ويستعين بمعبوده. He says the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in this hadith classified things that bad things that happen in life into two things. Something that you can achieve, you can achieve it either fully or partly. So you can achieve all of it or achieve some of it if it's good. Or something bad that you can either repel completely and avoid completely or avoid as much as possible of it. So he says, in this thing, the Prophet ﷺ is giving the advice that you should save no effort. You should, put, you should do everything you can to achieve the benefit and repel the, uh, the evil. Another type the Prophet ﷺ made, وَقِسْمًا لَا يُمْكِنُ فِيهِ ذَلِكْ and the other type is things you are helpless about, things that are beyond your capability, things you can't change, overwhelming things, things you can't change. So he's saying, فَهَذَا يَطْمَئِنُّ لَهُ الْعَبْدُ وَيَرْضَى وَيُسَلِّمُ He says, as to these things, the person should find peace in these things and should accept them and should submit to Allah. 
ولا ريب أن مراعاة هذا الأصل سبب للسرور وزوال الهم والغم He says there is no doubt that observing this advice is, one of, is, a, great, is a reason or is a means to happiness and to the removal of stress, pain and anxiety. So we have now four means uh, that the Shaykh has mentioned in his book. Again, to repeat them, Al-Iman Billah wal Amal Salih, having true faith and belief in Allah and righteous de- having righteous deeds. Second one, Al-Ihsanu ila al-Khalq, being good to, to people, extending acts of kindness and generosity and favors to them. Third, engaging in either a physical activity that can absorb your attention and can engage you, or engaging in some kind of study or learning that also attracts you and draws you in. And the third one, or the fourth one, is to focus on the present moment and the present day. And don't worry about the future and don't ruminate about the past. Does this that we mean that we don't plan? I said, no, we don't worry. We don't worry about the future. Planning, once you worry in the planning, you're not logical. You're not doing good planning. Planning needs a very clear mind, need detachment. So think about the future, but don't worry about it. The past, does that mean we don't reflect on our past? We don't think about it? No, there are so many lessons. Look into your past, accept it as the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you contributed to it, even if it's a sin that you've done in the past and you made tawbah of it, okay? Look, consider this to be the qada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reflect upon it, see the lessons that you can learn from it and try to detach from it. And then focus on your present day. Focus because that's the only day you have. And oftentimes, by the way, most people don't do what they should do is because they escape either in the future or in the past. Your life is what you live now. Your life is now, it's not tomorrow. It wasn't the past. The past is gone, it's not a reality anymore. The future has not come and it's not a reality yet. So what you truly have is your present moment. And there is nothing but the present moment, and that's a reality, there's nothing but the present moment. Because what you have about the past is a thought. The past is gone, it's non-existent. It's a thought. And the future is a thought. Tomorrow, tomorrow, Okay, now it's 7.44, 7.45 p.m. Tomorrow, like this time, is a thought. It's not a reality yet. But when you get there, when you get to that point, it will be present. When you come to tomorrow, 7.45 p.m., it will be the present moment. So the only, you can only deal with the present moment. You can't deal with the future. You can't deal with the past. But do we have to think about the future? As I said, yes, you have to think, you have to plan. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to have any future. It's normal to have plans, but you need to make it with more detachment. So you foc- you're focused about what you, and you're more logical about these things. You have clarity of thought. And we, but what is actually ad- your advice against? Worrying about the future. Worrying about the future in a sick way, because sometimes your concern about a bad future as well could push you into action, that's fine. As long as you do not lose focus, as long as you, it doesn't suck you in and you lose control, that's what we're talking about. But there's a level of worry that's actually healthy, right? Okay, tomorrow if I don't do this, so there will be you know, ramifications, there will be some consequences. That gives you a boost of worry that will actually push you into action, that's healthy and good. That's healthy and good. We're not talking about this again. But we're talking about the worry that causes you to lose balance, causes you to you know, fall into a state of stress and anxiety. That's what we're talking about. Okay, we have time to move on to uh, another means. He's saying, Faslun, وَمِنْ أَكْبَرِ أَسْبَاءَ الْأَسْبَابِ لِنْشِرَاحِ الصَّدْرِ وَطُمَأْنِينَتِهِ الْإِكْثَارُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ فإن لذلك تأثيرا عجيبا في انشراح الصدر وطمأنينته وزوال همه وغمه قال تعالى ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب 
فلذكر الله أثر عظيم في حصول هذا المطلوب لخاصيته ولما يرجوه العبد من ثوابه, من ثوابه وأجره He says one of the biggest means and most effective means to expanding your chest and finding peace and tranquility is to increase in the remembrance of Allah Dhikrullah Dhikrullah فَإِنَّ لِذَلِكَ تَأْثِيرًا عَجِيبًا He says this has magical, amazing impact on the expanding the chest and bringing ease to it and finding peace and tranquility and for the, uh, for the removal of anxiety and worry. Then he quotes the verse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Indeed, in the remembrance of Allah, the hearts find serenity, peace and tranquility. So he says, the remembrance of Allah has a very tremendous uh, impact in uh, removing anxiety, in achieving what we're talking about, which is removing anxiety and finding peace. And it also gives the hope of getting Allah's reward, uh, the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, dhikr of Allah when you try it first, it doesn't seem to pay off. You might push yourself into it days, weeks, months, and you don't see the payoff. You don't see the payoff. But if you stay consistent with it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open a door for you with dhikr. And then you will start finding so much sweetness in dhikr that you don't find in anything else. So there's a price and you need to pay. There's a threshold that you need to break through. So you need some consistency, and that's an advice. Try to do remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to do remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illa Allah. It, it gets to a stage where it becomes very addictive, not physically addictive, but the sweetness and the peace and the tranquility that penetrates your heart because of it, it becomes addictive. And if you don't do it, you feel there's a big part of you missing. You feel you've lost yourself. And the problem is that most people try, but they give up on it too early. There's a threshold that you need to push through. You need to stay consistent until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up for you that door of dhikr. And dhikr actually puts you in a state of companionship with Allah. It gives you a state of ma'iyya, what we call ma'iyya. You feel this closeness, al-unsu billah. You, f- you feel such a closeness to Allah that you can only find peace in that closeness. That's al-unsu billah. That's al-unsu billah. This is something you can only achieve through dhikr. You can only achieve through dhikr. And it's the dhikr according to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu not the dhikr according to some people who start singing it and doing so on different things, no. Not, it's not the dhikr that some people do when they jump up and down and they do it in unison and in a certain rhythm. That's not the way. The dhikr that came from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The hadith that came from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I remember like uh, <coughs> reading from uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, he says for himself he had a habit between Adhan al-Fajr and the Iqamah. He used to say, يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت برحمتك أستغيث أصلح لي شأني كله ولا تكلني إلى نفسي طرفة عين He says يا حي يا قيوم He's calling upon Allah يا حي You are the one who's alive You are alive and perfect in your own self القيوم is the one who gives life and sustenance to the creation So you are yourself alive, full of life and you give life and sustenance I seek, I beseech your help and your mercy. Fix all of my affairs so you let go. You let Allah be in charge. You fix all of my affairs. I hand them over to you. And don't, let, don't leave me for myself. Not even for a blink of an eye. Don't leave me for myself. You take care of me. I hand you over myself and all my affairs. Uh, yeah, that's the hadith. That's the, that's the dua. So he says, he said, I used to say this, and he said, whoever says this, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put life in their heart. He says, من قال ذلك بين من قال ذلك بين أذان الفجر والإقامة أحيا الله عز وجل قلبه فوجد حياة القلب. He says this is something that I, he found with, uh, with experimenting because even using the names of Allah Al-Hayy Al-Qayyum it has to do with, with life. Allah is the one who is alive, the source of life and the giver of life. Um, he also says مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ أَقْوَى النَّاسِ فَلْيُكْثِرْ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِلَهِ He says whoever wants to be the strongest of all people let him always say La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no power, there's no might except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these remembrances, each, each dua has a different impact on your heart. Some scholars have written this, certain things about these. What this dua does to the heart. What each dua does to your heart. What does it give, what does it offer your heart? So there's a world of dhikr that most of us have not, have not tapped into. Because, because we start with it and it becomes a bit redundant. We don't feel it. We give up on it too early. But try to do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It gives you as a state, as I said, a state of ma'iyya, companionship. You feel the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something so addictive you don't want to let go. You don't want to let go of that. Because it's such a pleasant feeling. And uh, you know there's the statement, famous statement from Ibn al-Qayyim. He says, Inna fil qalbi atashan la yarwihi. إِلَّا مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ وَمَحَبَّتُهُ وَالْأُنْسُ بِهِ وَالشَّوْقُ إِلَىٰ لِقَائِهِ He says there is a sense or a state of thirst in the heart that can never be satisfied or quenched except with knowing Allah, loving Him, feeling this closeness and companionship to Him, constant companionship with Him, and longing to see His face. Longing to see his face. He says there is this need in the heart that only this can satisfy. Nothing else will satisfy. Whatever you get, it will not satisfy this. And this is deep in the heart because that's what we are created for. And the heart is always searching for this. So you, the closer you can get to this in this life is through dhikr. It's through the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The problem with dhikr is that sometimes people do it as an exercise of the tongue. You need to get your tongue and your heart at the same rhythm, at the same wavelength. So when you say, subhanAllah, 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 subhan, you're not doing dhikr. You're not doing dhikr. I have one of my friends in the UK, very normal person, mashallah. But this person, as far as I know, لا نزكيه على الله نحسبه كذلك. He loves Allah so much. Very normal, ordinary Muslim, he knows very little about Islam, but he does so many good things for the sake of Allah. If you see him, Sometimes you might not even think he's a Muslim. But this person does so much goodness in his life to people. It's just mind-blowing. And one day I was spent like a day with him and he says to me, you know, I was thinking, looking at these people when they do dhikr, like after the salah, they say, subhanahu 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 He says, what if someone, like he loves uh, his wife. And let's say they just got engaged at the early stage. They got engaged or they just got married. And he always says to her, you know, I love you, I love, 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 love. How would she feel about this? What's this like an exercise? Verbal acrobats? But he says, what if, and that's, I'm, I'm trying even to capture his own tone, what he's saying. But listen to how when he turns to her in silence. So there's so much silence around. Because silence is important. It's part of what we say. Otherwise, if there's no silence, if there's no pauses, what we say doesn't make sense, right? It would be mumbo-jumbo words put together. But the silence gives the accentuation, it gives the meaning. So he says, he says, but if he turns to her and he says, I love you. He says, this is more powerful than thousands and thousands of love, 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 love. He says, most of us, most of us say, after the done. Done. You don't. That's not dhikr. That's not dhikr at all. That's not dhikr. So you do one, reflect on it. Let your heart and your tongue be at the same rhythm. When you say, Subhanallah, after salah, Subhanallah, think about the greatness 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the exalted. He's the free from all, from all imperfections. He's the perfect in all sense. Subhanallah, feel that. Let your heart sink into that feeling of great, recognizing the greatness of Allah. Then you will realize when you stand up after salah, having done subhanallah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, when you say alhamdulillah, you feel gratitude to Allah. Thank you Allah for everything. Praise be to you for whatever you do and whatever you say. And Allahu Akbar, how great Allah is. If you really let your heart sink in each one of those when you say them, when you stand up after the prayer, after doing the dhikr, after the prayer, you will be surprised that you actually you feel different about yourself. You think, the problem is that we don't give ourselves enough opportunity to really indulge into these beauties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. We don't indulge in this. And... Uh, I mean, there's amazing stories from the early generations about doing dhikr for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's really, and this is why many scholars said, dhikru uh, bustanu al-arifin. He said, it's the gardens for the ones who know Allah. There's nothing like this. Nothing like this. Peace and tranquility. It's paradise for the heart. So this is an encouragement that we take from this. Inshallah, next time we will carry on with this means, which is number five. It's the dhikr of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the dhakirin, the ones who remember Allah and know Allah our affairs and who re really benefit uh, from it and make dhikr with our hearts alongside our tongues. Jazakumullah khairan. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam.